Hello, so I'd like to uh, share with you uh, how a diabetes lab wound up studying pancreatic cancer. And thank you so much for the invitation to uh, share the work today and for the seed grant that's going to allow this work to move forward. So for many years, our lab had been studying a class of transcriptional activators called basic helix loop helix proteins, or BHLH proteins. They play numerous roles in the pancreas, including in cell fate decisions. Now, BHLH proteins are obligate dimers. In order to bind DNA, they must have a dimerization partner. But there's another class of proteins called the id proteins, id 1 through 4 in humans. And these act as negative regulators of BHLH proteins because they have the ability to dimerize, but they do not have the ability to, to bind DNA, and therefore they sequester BHLH proteins. During the course of our studies of BHLH and id proteins in the pancreas, we noticed something very unusual. Now, a normal duct-like structure in um, a mouse pancreas is outlined in white on the left. And these are cells which are normally quiescent, as are most mature cell types in the body. They uh, do not exhibit ID3 expression, which would be shown in green, nor do they exhibit KI67, a marker of proliferation. But when we looked at a mouse model of pancreatitis, we found enormous upregulation of the ID3 uh, protein on the same day that we could recognize the first proliferative cells in the uh, ductal hyperplasia. And so we were very interested in whether this ID3 could be actually playing a role in these initiating events. So we went on to look in human disease. And in the human uh, pancreas, we don't see ID3, again, in uh, normal exocrine pancreas, which would be in green here. And duct structures are outlined in red with the marker CK19. However, when we look in pancreatic cancer, again, the ID3 expression is quite high in the abnormal structures. And in fact, ID3 expression increases with severity of disease. So this, of course, was only an association. It didn't prove that ID3 is playing any role. So we asked whether if we take normally quiescent human exocrine tissue and we ectopically express ID3, would it push those cells into the cell cycle? And in fact, it was very efficient in this process. The cells became Ki67 positive, phosphohistin H3 positive, which is a marker of mitosis, and positive for phosphohistone H3. Now you might say, well, this is a protein that can be linked with growth in some other tissues, so isn't this what one would expect? But in fact, we found uh, cell type specific effects of ID3 even within the pancreas because when ID3 was expressed in the islets of the same human pancreas, those cells underwent replication stress and did not uh, progress through the cell cycle. And in fact, we're wondering if this really has a message for us about the pathogenesis of both diabetes, in which we are trying to get beta cells to replicate, to make up for beta cell loss, and they don't replicate in response to a stimulus, and pancreatic cancer, in which it looks as if the uh, exocrine cells in the pancreas are maybe more poised than we would like to replicate and respond quite efficiently to um, a replication or mitogenic response. So basically, what we've uh, noticed is that in normal tissue, there is some level of BHLH, basic helix loop helix activity that needs to be sustained. And under conditions of high id protein, that activity is thrown off balance. And so the simplistic way of looking at how do we restore normalcy to pancreatic cancer cells is to lower id3, or id proteins in general. And we've done that, and that works. 
But again, we think of this as a yin-yang situation. It may not be the absolute amount of either the basic lupelix protein or the id protein that matters most, but the balance to the cell. And so we asked whether another way to approach this would be to overexpress a BHLH protein and see if we could counteract the effects of ID3 in pancreatic cancer cells. And we chose the protein E47 because it has the ability to homodimerize and have activity on certain genes, but it also has the uh, activity of dimerizing with other transcription factors known to be important in the pancreas. So in a first experiment, we asked, will E47 then downregulate the growth we see in pancreatic cancer cells in culture? And I show here two ways, first by KI67 staining, and then with growth curves, that in fact, it absolutely is true that by altering the balance, even if we don't affect the expression of ID3 by altering that balance, we could change the uh, growth rate of pancreatic cancer cells 180-fold within eight days. Now, we'd really like to know the mechanism of action by which E47 is controlling growth in these cells. And we've done tissue microarrays, and we noticed that almost all the core cell cycle machinery activators are down-regulated by E47, not surprisingly, and that the genes that are up-regulated are the cell cycle inhibitors, what we call CDKIs. And we decided, because of the pleiotropic effects that the CDKIs can have in cells, to examine those first and see whether they were the pathway E47 is taking to promote growth arrest in pancreatic cancer. The first one that we looked at is known as KIP2 or P57. And although it was enormously upregulated by E47, we found in knockdown or overexpression studies that it played no functional role in E47's ability to induce growth arrest. And the second CDKI in the same family of inhibitors that we looked at is P21. So P21 was upregulated quite a bit by E47 at both the message level on the left and uh, in Western blots at the protein level on the right. And so we asked, is P21 required for E47-mediated growth arrest? And we did this with siRNA experiments. So if you look at the left-hand panels, these are cells that are arrested by E47, and they don't express Ki67 in the top left, which would be indicative of proliferating cells, and they express high levels of P21 down below. And if we use siRNA to P21, we find that E47 is no longer able to induce complete growth arrest in those cells. So we believe that E47 keeps equanimity in the exocrine pancreas through P21. And P21 loss has been associated with pancreatic cancer, but no one knew the mechanism by which it was acting before or how it was controlled. So we were interested in another potential feature of the BHLH-ID axis, and that is that often in cancer, and this is true in pancreatic cancer as well, that as cells increase their proliferation rate, they decrease their differentiated status, and we often call this de-differentiation. And why is that? Why do the two go hand in hand? And how could one mechanism potentially be controlling both, since we seem to see them always in tandem? So to get at this question, we wondered whether we could be controlling genes that are activated normally by another BHLH protein in the pancreas, a pancreas-specific protein called PTF1. Now, PTF1 cannot function unless it binds to a protein like E47. 
So although it's been controversial whether PTF1 is still expressed in pancreatic cancer cells, we have found evidence that it is still expressed. Some people haven't found it in some samples. But if the pancreatic cancer cells have high ID3, we expect the PTF1 cannot be active because it can no longer bind DNA, as ID3 would be sequestering it. So how about when we throw this balance to the other side and we express E47? What we find now on the top left is that by Western blot, we actually see increased levels of PTF1. And I believe that this is because PTF1 has an autoregulatory uh, element in its own promoter. But importantly, the de-differentiation, we call it, when we see in pancreas, uh, cancer means that the cells stop making their normal proteins that they would secrete into the digestive system to digest food. And when we express E47 in pancreatic cancer cells in culture, we now see large upregulation of these enzymes that are PTF1 responsive. And in fact, they require PTF1. Uh, and those include trypsinogen, elastase, and uh, CPA2. Moreover, for those of you who deal with uh, cancer and for the scientists in the group, we also see that the cells are returning to a more polarized type of cell as evidenced by ZO1 expression in tight junctions between cells. So it looks as if E47 is concurrently uh, causing growth arrest in the cells at the same time that it's causing them to re-differentiate into their normal cell type. Now, we wondered whether any of this takes place in vivo. And if we have high ID3, what we would predict is that that would look maybe like an animal in which PTF1 had been knocked out because PTF1 wouldn't be able to be active. Well, this has actually been done. And in mice, on the bottom left, let's see, uh, these are normal mouse pancreata at uh, embryonic day 18. And in dark blue is where PTF1 is, and this is the pancreas forming. But when PTF1 is knocked out, what happens is the dark blue cells here and here the pancreatic progenitors wind up misappropriated to the intestine. Essentially, they remain a stem cell and don't differentiate. Well, this has been done in mouse, and it's been beautiful work. And what was even a surprise to me is that the same work can be replicated in zebrafish. And that we, the, uh, these important proteins in the pancreas are so highly conserved that uh, a colleague of mine, Duke Dong, knocked out PTF1 in the developing zebrafish pancreas and found that instead of a normal pancreas, as seen here, you wind up with the pancreatic progenitor cells, again, misappropriated to the ducts uh, of the intestine or to the gut enlarged. And so we wondered if this zebrafish model might be a great model for looking at ID3 overexpression. But of course, it would be important that ID3 would be expected to have similar effects in both animals. And if you look at um, zebrafish ID3 sequence, which is just highlighted with the red bars, one can see, even without reading the individual letters, that we have very high conservation between humans and zebrafish. So we set out to make the first animal model of ectopic ID3 expression. And to do this, uh, the uh, Dong Lab, in collaboration with us, generated a construct so that we would be able to induce ID3 in zebrafish whenever we wanted by a process called heat shock. And the beautiful advantage of working with zebrafish is that when the embryo is developing, it's entirely transparent. So one can even look at live fish to see what's going on. And what we noticed right away, if you look at the top right where the arrow is, 
is that instead of one field, one circular field where the pancreatic progenitors should be, there's a second field, and that winds up being the cells in the intestine. In contrast, the normal animal below, um, the bottom right, has only a single pancreatic field. So if we induce ID3, we are causing the exact same morphologic phenotype as knocking down PTF1. And so for the first time, we're showing that this does actually happen in the animal. And oddly enough, zebrafish is being used as a pancreatic cancer model as well. And there is a, an, um, a zebrafish which overexpresses KRAS and gets a pancreatic cancer phenotype. So now we can do important studies to look at what role ID3 might play in the uh, pathogenesis as the disease progresses. When we look more closely at the animal, we can find these uh, progenitors on the right-hand panel, circled in red, in the intestine. And so we're able, we can even dissect these out to study exactly what's being expressed in those cells. Those cells are positive for HNF4 and other intestinal markers. So what we believe is that in ID3 expressing cells, we get pancreatic reprogramming or dedifferentiation because PTF1 is blocked. So we no longer have PTF1 responsive uh, genes expressed. And that the proliferative side of pancreatic cancer is being controlled by ID3's blocking of P21. And that under normal circumstances, E47 is doing the opposite in the cells. And so when there's high ID3, we have misappropriation. And what we'd really like to look at is a potential link between these cells and what are called cancer stem cells. Are these the cells that are, tend to be the intractable cells when we look at um, it normal therapeutics? And when ID3 is high, we get too much proliferation starting even with pancreatitis and progressing on to, pan to pancreatic cancer. So now we come back to that issue of how do we restore balance to the BHLH activity level? What are the methods we might want to use? And here I've spent years looking at methods for developing therapeutics for diabetes. And some of the technology we've been working on, I think, is very applicable to these questions, not just in my lab, but of my colleagues here, and I wanted to share some of this with you. One of the ways that we're starting to look at this is, although a number of uh, oncogenes affect proliferation in a pancreatic exocrine cell, one question has been, are we going to have to attack each of these oncogenes separately or is there a way we can make a unified effort to control the proliferation? So could it be that we have one target to hit to deal with pancreatic cancer? And what are some of these therapeutic technologies that we've been working on in the lab? Well, one issue that comes up for a number of therapies is what if we find from the analysis of our arrays that the best treatment is a protein-based therapy. And many of you have probably heard of some for other diseases where people get infusions of monoclonal antibodies or other proteins. And I want to suggest a technology that we've used to develop a therapy for diabetes in collaboration with a biotech company in San Diego. And that is that cells that are secreting the protein of choice can be encapsulated. And that way, we could have potentially continuous delivery of a protein instead of twice weekly infusions or that type of treatment. And uh, this is a, a wonderful technology that's available and I think quite underutilized. But what we'd really like is pharmacologic intervention in which a small molecule, or more commonly known as a drug, is discovered. And how can we go about this? At the institute where I have a joint appointment and my lab is, 
we have a high throughput screening center for drug discovery. And for any patients in the audience, the thing I want to tell you is that work that would have taken my lab a year, 20 years ago, can now take two weeks because we have the robotics to go after, to look at million chemicals in a time we used to be able to look at 100 chemicals. And so how does one go about this? Well, once you've engineered cells to um, act appropriately in the manner that you hope to find a drug which can do, we just simply engineer them so that they turn green when the pathway is ignited and thereby we can use libraries of hundreds of thousands of chemicals that have been vetted by medicinal chemists as ones that are likely to have a high half-life in the body to be tolerated, not be toxic, and that those family members have been shown to have therapeutic effects in other diseases. And uh, this is an example of a high throughput assay that a colleague and I developed to find molecules that increase expression from the insulin gene. And in fact, this assay has worked quite well and we have a, a family of compounds that have been identified. I would like to use some of my seed funding to develop an assay like this to find drugs which will target the BHLH balance in pancreatic cancer cells. And finally, and this may sound even more surprising, I work with brilliant engineers who have come up with ways that high throughput microscopes can actually tell the difference between a zebrafish, which has one field of pancreatic progenitor cells, versus one that has abnormally high levels of id 3 and so has stem cells in an inappropriate spatial orientation. And so it's actually possible for us to look for drugs that act in vivo on an animal as it's developing that affect the same pathway. Oops. Sorry. And how one does this is a beautiful process called tessellation. If you can see, the, the red is a little bleached out there to find areas that are pinpointed by the microscope and measured for their intensity and their uh, spatial orientation uh, in uh, conjunction with a key element. And so to summarize what we found, we found that ID3 in pancreatic cancer cells is downregulating P21 and that E47 is the normal gene which keeps P21 levels high. And we found that ID3 causes problems both early and late in the pancreas because ID3 causes abnormal pancreatic organogenesis by blocking PTF1 and its uh, formation of the pancreas and progenitor cell population and cohort. And that PTF1 later in pancreatic cancer is responsible for the loss of dedifferentiation when ID3 downregulates PTF1 activity. So finally, I'd like to thank my students and a postdoc in the lab and my collaborator, the uh, zebrafish guru, Duke Dong, and a postdoc in his lab as well, Keith Gates. And I'd particularly like to help the Hirschberg Foundation because as one changes from diabetes to pancreatic cancer, it's a seed grant that, like this that allows one to take an interdisciplinary approach to this disease. Thank you so much.